Hello, everyone, and welcome to Books and Done. I'm your host, Livia J. Elliott, and today we have another spotlight episode. So let me welcome Susanne Machinario, author of a mythological sleep slim series titled Timelessness. Susanna, welcome, and thank you so much for joining me. Hello, Livia. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, my name is Susanne Machinario. I am the author of Timelessness, a few other things, but we are here to talk about timelessness. And this is also a special episode because Varsha, booktuber and podcaster, is joining me to interview Susanna. Varsha, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. I've been uh, looking for an opportunity to pick Susanna's brain about some of the things in the Timelessness series. Uh, so yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Awesome. So before we start, let me do the usual disclaimers. First, there are spoilers in this podcast. We will tackle the first five books of Susanna's series, Timelessness, that is We Are Gods, The Dark One, Nephilim's Heads, Anachrony, and Anamnesis. But just to be on the safe side, we will not spoil her upcoming book, Oli. So you can listen safely in that regard. Second, many of what you will hear is our subjective interpretation of the themes within the story. You are allowed to disagree. That said, I will hand it over to Varsha to start with the questions. I think one of the things that I found really interesting in Timelessness was this sort of what I called a reverse magical realism in one of the forum threads where like technology is presented as if it is magic, but then it starts to become recognizable technology. If I'm not wrong, I think that teleportation devices are elevators and <laughs> there are androids and I guess maybe some genetic cloning stuff too. So I was, I was curious about like just how you went about building that aspect of the world. Well, yeah, I started with the magic because we are, most of the characters are gods and they have their own, I call it talents, you know, their powers and their talents. So they, they are, they can bend the laws of nature at their will to some degree, depending on, um, what are their, um, their talents. You know, for example, if uh, Apollo has an affinity with stars, Zeus, Zeus is a tricky one <laughs> with, with lightning, I suppose, that sort of thing. And then there's the Nephilim which are this uh, a society or an, an AI pantheon, let's put it this way. <laughs> they try to imitate the gods' powers through technology and reverse engineer everything they can do through technology. Jumping off from that a little bit, I also, like, I am not remotely familiar with the mythology, like to the levels that I need to be. I have some stories, some names are familiar to me, but mostly I read all of them as characters that I would in any other book. So two questions there. One, when writing, how did you think about try to, because I found it immensely readable, even though I wasn't familiar with the mythology. So did you have to think about how to present this for someone who is not familiar with the mythology? And also, I'm pretty sure there are several laying Easter eggs for those who are familiar with the mythology. And then like the second stuff, the talents and stuff that you mentioned, was it how much of that did you make up <laughs> and uh, how much of it is based in actual myth? Uh, okay, so separating the questions. I tried to write timelessness so everyone could understand to some degree what was going on. Looking back, I think um, I've made it quite hard. If, if you don't know enough about Greek and Norse mythology, you're going to be quite lost. Um, so since then, I've added, um, oh, what's the name, Dramatis Personae on my website. Uh, I mean, I intended to insert it in the book. I haven't, it's going to be maybe in a special edition later on. And I think Weird Gods would have benefited from it because lots of readers, if they don't, even if they only know the names and they don't know what are they the god of or some bits of their mythology, they're going to be very lost because I built upon that. It's uh, timelessness is a sort of continuation of the myth. If you do enjoy mythology and you know all their stories or have an idea of the, their, their in directions and you're gonna you know have a lot of fun reading it it's not 100 percent faithful to the original mythology i had for plot reasons i had to take some liberties 
especially with uh, the centaur Chiron. There's there's reasons for that that I won't go into. But if you know the mythology, you'll catch little asides in conversations during the banter. You'll, you'll probably can see what's going to happen next beforehand. The ending, it, it, it's a different experience. I guess as the book progressed, because I, I I wrote it all as one as one book. Weird Gods used to be what is now Timelessness, and as I split it in, in four books, every time I would revise, I tried to simplify it or to not rely so much in the original mythology. The Nephilim they are completely made up. I mean, I borrowed the name, and and that was that. They, they have nothing to do with uh, with the Nephilim in mythology. I, I just I just thought it was cool. I don't want to include any aspect of Christian or pre-Christian mythology. And it was a, was a decision I've made early on. I, I sometimes, I think I mentioned Jehovah or I made some obscure references to Jesus here and there. So I, I'm, I'm not excluding exactly, but I'm not going to go into that because uh, people get offended very easily. And, um, but I borrowed the name and created this whole entity of artificial intelligence. Um, something that I wanted to ask you is that how did you choose? Because I found it very interesting that you were mixing pantheons. You had the Greeks mostly, you have Norse mythology, you have Kali as well. And at the start, I was expecting to find Thanatos as a god of death. But then it was Kali, and I thought it was quite suitable for the story, especially because how Kali is presented to be far more violent than Thanos if you compare the stories. But there are in many cases that you choose one pantheon rather than the other, and in some cases both coexist, like Hell and Hades, which are not quite the same. So my question is, how did you choose and how did you weave in the different stories to make it coherent so i started with greek mythology it's, that's the the foundation but greek cosmology it's the mediterranean there's a, not a lot going on so i borrowed the cosmology from norse mythology and then added a few uh, gods from that pantheon kelly was first because i needed a female aspect to, to balance Kronos. And I don't know anything about the mythology. I, I know a little bit more now, thanks to Lord of Light. Thank you. But at the time, I just knew names. And I did a quick search. This is true. This is you know, my, my process for Gods of Time. And I don't know if the page was reliable or not, but I, I read that Kali was the goddess of death and the end of time or that has the end of time and so that's that's the one that i'm going to pick because and even the name was more familiar than thanatos and there's there's another reason there's a whole subplot involving the titans the primordial gods of each mythology that i just started to get into in oda there's there there are reasons why the, the original gods are not part of the cast apart from Pr- Prometheus and Shira, who are titans. I thought it was a great choice as well, especially given what happens at the end when Kali, when Psyche gives Kali to Gaia. We end up having a goddess that is both of life and death, like the entire mm-hmm. cycle. I found that fascinating. So if you can tell us a bit more of the why that was a choice. Psyche makes an explanation within the story, but I would like to know more the writer's side. What led you to decide mixing them? Now here we're going to get into a psychological aspect of timelessness. Psyche is the main character. Again, it's kind of a very obvious pun on the whole thing. I, I rely a lot on psychology and what it means to be human, and the workings of the mind, and especially cognitive dissonance. I've noticed that's why everyone, almost everyone, has two names, two aspects, etc. They are in conflict with each other. And Cronus is the same. So basically, Gaia came about so Kali had something to kill, if that makes sense. And it was that uh, it was Cronus' weakness after their fight and whatever, that, that sliver of soul that stayed in him to balance everything that Gaia was doing, which was another aspect of the original goddess. Without spoiling too much of what comes next, that's what I could do, but it, I needed the way to balance. And then Psyche, who is the goddess of the soul, managed to unite as much as she could of the original soul and put the responsibility of death in life 
not not in time, if that makes sense. He, she thought that she was doing the opposite of what Kronos wanted, but maybe not. Maybe just wanted to be rid of that responsibility. When Gaia uses her power, we see that she can give life, but it's costly to her. She mm-hmm. is often described as a crone, like looking very old, especially towards the end when she uses a lot of her power. Mm-hmm. I found it very interesting that giving life actually seems to take the life out of her or in somehow, and that is why it affects her. And I love what you say about death being the responsibility of life, right? Because at yeah. the end of the day, that's where we are all coming, going, basically. Yeah, well, keep in mind that Gaia and, and most gods in, in the cast, they, they are a bit of a drama queen. <laughs> you, you can't trust every, every, everything that they tell you or show. But the idea is not so much the, the giving life aspect of it, is the giving away part of her soul. Every life, especially a life that has a soul or is able to host a soul, she has to kind of split her own soul more and more. That's why I think I mentioned this in time also in one of the info dumps to kind of uh, to, to make sense that um, when she started, she when she started with the primordial gods, she was giving away too much of her soul, and that's and and then with the gods it was still too much, and that's why then she's started creating mortals because you know they took little effort you know she 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 wasn't losing herself too much yeah no i i found that aspect very interesting too and i think one of my favorite bits in the series was this mythology around the origin of time and his battle with nyx and uh, and also slightly unrelated his commentary around uh the fact that gravity hasn't affected him this way when he comes to the planet, which I thought is immensely interesting because I, I and we talked about this a little bit on the forum, but to repeat for, for our listeners, that seems to be heading towards a an origin story for time v gravity for some relativity origin story. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like whatever you can without spoiling anything that's coming later. Because I, I found <laughs> I find origin stories like that immensely fascinating. If you read Timelessness, you realize that it starts at the end and goes full circle. Ev- everything, every even not all chapters, but every bit of story that I write, I try to make it go full circle. And so I'm working my way backwards to the beginning of time. So as we peel the layers, that's why later on we'll learn a bit more about the primordial gods. Uh, we'll learn a bit more about the creation of the underworlds. We're going to learn a bit more about the souls and uh, and then working on it. And you were the first person who noticed that time and gravity. And when I wrote it, I was like, like you pointed out, you know, this is not quite right. But I wanted to plant that that little we call it the flea behind the ear kind of, uh, <laughs> the kind of questions and no no this this doesn't make sense you know every time you read timelessness and there's something that no this doesn't make sense you're pretty sure that you stumble on, upon something i will mention more and more gravity even at the, at the very beginning psyche wakes up in elena's body and she fells she makes a comment so that you know gravity uh, reminding us just how little we mm. are, how insignificant we are, uh, how powerless, yes, that's what she said. So yeah, expect a showdown. It was originally, it was nine books, and it'll be at the last book. But now that I split it in so many books and I'm doing standalones, it might happen sooner than mm. uh, it was plotted. I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> that bit was actually quite interesting, and I wanted to pick up on what you say that you are always going full circle with the with time. The story of Anne in Anachrony is exactly that. Mm-hmm. I thought it was mind blowing because we go back at the start of Anachrony to another period of time, and then it ends exactly at the same moment that Nephilim's hex ends, and it adds so mm-hmm. much to it. So can you share a bit more about how you tied up that idea of Anne as a new character within the story and the clues that you are mentioning throughout her stint in a different timeline? Ariane, she was I was she was not planned. Nothing in Anachrony was planned. The, the whole thing was supposed to happen in an interlude kind of just a, an, an, an info dump, just a couple of paragraphs. Ariane, even her name, so it's an anagram for Reina, which means queen in Portuguese. She was the most 
two-dimensional character I had originally. She was just supposed to be, you know, placeholder character, just just looking pretty in a book, and she was going to be killed very quickly. And then we would find out later on in an interlude who she really was, etc. But it was one of those cases, a serious case of the more I, I wrote about her, the more I wanted to explore this character, tell more. The interlude was supposed to be just a couple of paragraphs. It just kept growing, <laughs> growing you know, and before I knew I had over you know, like 15,000 words in other words. Like, I can't just this is too long of an interlude. This is going to break the flow of, of the book. What am I going to do? And then I, I wrote a novella, so the series interlude. But that was not planned. That, that, that was a complete derail from, from the plot. But I, I think in the end, it helped. I think that it, w- it was a bit more impactful than just finding out, oh, by the way, you know, that character that no one cared about, uh, she was this, that. I planted hits at the beginning, the whole thing about the marriage and this. I hope that would be enough for people paying attention that even when she's talking with Elena, I try to, to make it seem like they had the same mannerisms in a way. But yeah, I, I am glad that I delved deeper into that aspect because she's a great character. She is, and it's quite interesting how she changes because when you start the story, she's very young and mm-hmm. it feels young, you know, like, ah, I want to be queen, I want this, I want that. Some wishes that are sometimes a bit too flat, not because the character is flat, but because she's young and she yeah. sees everything in a very simplistic way. And then when she goes back in time or future to that timeline, she grows so quickly. The novella is very short and we can see how everything changes her and how she starts regretting some of the choices and seeing herself as a I was this very young, naive person. And when she arrives back at the current timeline and in the last book, it's a completely different character. Mm-hmm. Everything she went through changed her so much. I found it fascinating, honestly. Thank you. Uh, she she did became my favorite. It's really I was not expecting, but I I just went with it. Questioned myself a lot. Oh, should I do it? No, this is just gonna break the story. This is not what I intended. But sometimes, you know, just try. Just go with it and see what happens. And I'm I'm very proud of, of that little that little side. If I may touch on Anne a bit more and perhaps go into the rest of the series, there is a an ongoing theme that wishing is dangerous right mm-hmm. and we quite often see how wishes are twisted especially with Anne however Psyche which is a main character she wants to take control of her life of the future she has ideas and goals but she never referred to them as wishes and it's very she it's very precise like throughout the five books, the wording on Psyche is very precise in that regard. What were your ideas regarding wishing and wishing as a dangerous thing? Well, if you read Anamnesis and you read the Anamnesis interludes, which are two trick a trickster, you know, she, she made one wish that, you know, was enough to, she, she learned a lesson with her wish. But yes, it is deliberate that she never wishes for anything. And even when Loki teases her, when she, when he does what she wants, you always say, as you will. She's all about will, not wishes. She's, she's a goddess of, of willpower. But yeah, but she did make one wish that changed everything. And, and that was that. She, she won't do any wishes again. Yeah, but sometimes it feels that it goes a bit beyond her. We have Anne is very clear, but also Elena. It's the opposite. Elena is all the time wishing, 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 yeah. wishing, and doing nothing about it. She's yeah. of, she expects the things to come in. And interesting because Elena was uh, gave her body to Psyche, basically hosted Psyche. Nevertheless, they are such different characters. Yeah, that, that's why I had to put them together. I was playing with the idea because we see a lot of possession. The person changes when she's or he's possessed by something. And this I, I try to reverse again. I would see how, how the soul would change with being inside the mind of having to work with the mind of a host that is completely different to, to what they are. And it's so I, I work the conflict in person. They are very different. And I, I don't know if I succeeded. I would have done better or at least different now. Um, the, the conflict between their personalities. But I think in the end, they both, or at least Psyche benefited a little bit because at the beginning, she's just too much of a, she's too pragmatic, too much of a cynic. She doesn't, she, 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 she doesn't wish for anything. She doesn't even want anything. She just wants to be left alone. Have, having to work with, with a mind that is so prone to, 
oh, this is so pretty. Oh, I want this. Oh, I want it. And, you know that. You know she 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 kind of got a little bit of her of her humanity back, I think, even though it was not to a human. Let's put it this way. While Elena, I think she she, she got the worst part of the deal because it made her bitter. Uh, we went, when we see her later on, she she went straight from little naive petulant girl to just being very entitled, demanding, and bitter. And spiteful, she she kind of inherit all the the dark side of psyche in a way because psyche can be very spiteful and bitter as well. Even even when she doesn't act on it, she she, she always thinks about it. I'm like you know, the things I could do to you, but I'm not. <laughs> I I always thought that she had some parallelisms to Glockta from Ellen <clears throat> Crombie. Like she has a lot of opinions all the time. All the <laughs> she, may not, she may not act on it, but she has so many opinions. And it's always, it felt interesting throughout the book, but on the last one, on an amnesis, when we get to find out everything that Eros did to her, it's mm-hmm. like it ties up a cycle. Now you finally see why she's so sour, so bitter, why she thinks the way she thinks the quote unquote advice she gives to Aidan. It's very mm-hmm. clear at that point it everything ties up. So all of those opinions, I don't want to call her opinionated because I don't think she is. All of those opinions and her vision of the world tied beautifully mm-hmm. with what happened in the past, right? And mm-hmm. you also have this theme going on of the consequences of reactions, you know, throughout the entire series. Mm-hmm. And in her, we see that it made her that way. So were you thinking of a particular theme or aspect of the consequences of the actions uh yes uh, first let me say psyche she she is opinionated and she's very judgmental that was the very deliberate the thing about cause and consequence so i think i said in timelessness as well that chronos is not so much the god of time but is the cause of uh, the god of cause and consequence because that's my interpretation or in the books of the arrow of time of things just go in one direction unless you have to apply some magic into it and the chronodendrons and all that and, and that was the thing that changed everything even for the gods, because they were used to live in the, to no, never having to deal with the actions of their consequences, or unless ages passed, and then suddenly there was time, they, they, they just had to think things through. Um, but yeah, every it, it's the the cause and effect. No good deed goes unpunished. I, I use all these aphorisms time and again. Just you know, it's it's inspired in mythology, so it is at its heart. A cautionary tale. It kind of, I, hopefully, would make you think through your own actions and your own biases and prejudices and opinions and how they might play out in a universe that is not constrained by the laws of society as we know it. Just focusing on the mind, and uh, it's it's a very thin line throughout the book that I play with between self-preservation and selfishness, and what can you do to walk that line with the minimal consequence? Well, at the end of the day, you need to be a bit selfish in order to ensure self-preservation. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Psyche, <laughs> I thought it was hilarious that the first thing she did after she became a goddess was go to sleep for several thousand years. <laughs> I could definitely relate to that. But on a more general uh, note about the character, yeah, I was curious about your choice for the main character and jumping off of that a little bit also what your background in mythology is why you were interested in this specific character did you start from the character and build a story around her like this goddess and build the story around her or did you want to start or did you start with like you said uh you wanted to play with uh, aspects of the soul and psychology and so you picked this goddess yes so the, the whole thing started with to trick a trickster which is something i wrote the very first draft i was in my 20s it was uh, again one of those exercises i would write dialogues between gods the myth of psyche and heroes i always made me angry because i think it's it's so so wrong on so many levels and when I learned about Loki, I figured, you know, this this would be the sort of thing that Trickster God would definitely try to uh, take advantage of. The whole saying of heroes only coming at night and, and, and never let himself be seen. So the, the original thing was a bit more, it was, yeah, it was a little bit more uh, spicy. But it's, then it evolved from there and it, it took years and I would, it was always at the back of my mind. And yeah, there was basically three reasons when I finally decided 
to to use psyche uh one was because i've learned to love the character that i created over the years and it was supposed to be a psychological tale so why not no one was doing retellings or as far as i if i know there there were no retellings of psyche and heroes at least no famous ones which was great because it was at the time where everyone was doing retellings 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 uh, in the in the forums whenever someone asked what's your favorite god or what's this and that psyche was never mentioned he's like well i i, I need to 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 do something about this and i was i was going to focus a lot on souls on the on what makes us human on the and my magic system was you know willpower and soul so of course i would have to have the goddess of the soul involved there there, there was only one that there's no other goddess of the soul that i know of please correct in any pantheon so it had to be psychic Mm. Yeah, it, it's really interesting to read books that have gods as characters. I think I'm a huge fan of Malaz and I harped on about that endlessly. But also uh, The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms by N.K. Jemisin. I think what I loved about both of those series um, is that the gods, the way they are written, like there's this, they seem human when they are taking on aspects that interact with humans. But when they are gods, they blow your mind. Like, I especially love that in A Hundred Thousand Kingdoms because one of the gods makes a joke in one of the novellas <laughs> that, oh, you might think that a black hole is like a baby. Nah, nah. And like, but it'll poke you. It'll hurt you. Right? These are gods. They're playing with black holes. So, yeah. I and, and I found some of that in this book as well. Like when Loki takes on his true form to intimidate. I forget which character, but and I, I love that scene where, <laughs> where he, and, and it also reminds reminded me a bit of like uh, this thing in Hindu mythology. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but gods take on what we call Vishwarupam to show like this uh, a true form <laughs> to uh, say, like, I might seem human to you, but I am a god here. Is what I really look like. <laughs> You'll go crazy if you see me all the time. So, yeah. Um, so, I guess my question for you is, <laughs> after all that rambling, um, is what how what was it like to write about gods like how did you figure out how to balance the writing of (laughs) like that god and balance it out to be characters that we can relate to and actually like not like we're just reading about gods but also have these people that we can relate to follow like you know judge things off as we read it's funny you mentioned 100,000 kingdoms and and this this is true i have a video about it buried in my youtube channel when i first started with gods i stumbled into that problem because even though i was basing myself in greek mythology where the gods are very human like or relatable they were coming across diminished kind of as it happens in american gods it's one of my complaints about the book when it's set in america and another that the gods appear very diminished in in that environment i i was stuck there thinking that i would be doomed to write an urban fantasy until i read hundred thousand kingdoms and then i knew exactly what i had to do so i i have a lot to thank for that for that book because it's a it shows I, I had I really had to go into the the fantasy aspect of it to just not care because I was still too attached, especially with the Nephilim and this too too attached to, to the science fiction to try to create something that made sense. And I, I had to realize the gods don't make sense. That's the mm-hmm. whole point. Their motivations, their aspects, their whole relationship in reality does not make sense from our point of view. So they, they tone it down to deal with the, with the mortal cal- the characters. But once in a while, we have to show the reader that they, we are dealing with gods. When I read that book, I got that sense of it was not just the danger, but the, the unknown, that, uh, that sense of restrained power. Throughout the story, you also make a lot of scenes in which we can clearly see see that the gods don't have the same ethics. They don't see the world in the same way that a mortal will do it. For example, Hel always struck me in that sense when she's discussing that she created the dark hand. Her approach is, I created this thing, yay! While the rest of the gods is, can you see the danger on the thing that you created? And the humans and the rest of the races, they see it as something extremely dangerous that it shouldn't be there, that is a predator and for the dark and we can see all the point of view but her own point of view, it's the one that feels the most foreign to us mm-hmm. as a reader. You did that quite a lot in different parts of the series. Uh, yeah, th- th- there's a reason why the whole thing is written from very, very limited, very, very limited points of view. I think I have 12 in Weird Gods. There's a lot of points of view and they are all very focused on 
that one of your characters. And I even have some scenes that were the hardest thing to write. And in the same scene, and then from the point of view of different characters in that scene and how different it plays out, perceive what's happening and what they're thinking about it. And it's all about that because we, we don't know... We, we live inside our heads. We only have to work with our senses. We, we don't we don't know what everyone's thinking. Whether the gods know to some degree, if the others let them know. But you know, we are very biased in in every action. Uh, Hell sees the darken as yeah. Look, look, you know, I'm the goddess of of, of the dead, but I, I can also create. Take that guy, and as a means to kind of fight back, yeah, just to to reassert herself. In the pantheon, while ev- everyone else, especially if they are in the, in the, in the life side of, of things, they're like, "No, this this is not a good idea." And now the question is: Does she did, did she know what, what she was doing when she is Loki's daughter? So there's there's that to be explored. I have a planned slash follow up question to what you just talked about the rewinding that we do for each scene. Like we we never start where we left off. You always rewind a little bit and then start. And I also see that you played with, I don't know if played is the right word, but you changed tense a lot in writing the course of, throughout the course of the book. So, and, and of course, that's interesting because the series, a big theme is about time. (laughs) There's a lot of like time based themes in the series. So I was curious how your choice of tense uh, played with also like what you were doing with time. I, I needed a way to, to tell the reader to dif- differentiate in what was happening and what happened before, let's put it this way, or what was happening behind stage. So I, I, I needed an anchor point in, in Weird Gods, that psyche is the view that, that that is the anchor point. Everything else is uh, kind of happening around her. And then I kind of flip uh, with, with the dark. And same thing, but it's almost like everything kind of happened it is about to happen and again psyche and nader are, are just going through like a like a river going through the through the, the events but i had to separate the two because i i thought that otherwise everyone will be really really lost i i, I didn't want to to write something that you know, people would need a notebook and a chart and you know even just for for my sake i, I needed that structure and i you know i at the time, it was a, an, an exercise to kind of learn how to write in English. It was it was just brought to my attention. I am writing a novella now. It's uh, my first retelling. I, I, I swear I would never do it, but I am writing a retelling of the Minotaur myth from the Minotaur point of view. Oh, and, nice. it, and I just realized that it's the first story that I'm writing in first person past. It blew my mind as a wow, you, you just, after all these years, you finally... <laughs> doing something normal but yeah i had to, had to play with that and anachrony i was going with first person present but then i i read i can't remember the book i don't think i finished it but it was second person present it was the first time i read something in second person present and i felt it, it just gave me a, such a an anxious state and it's like no i'm gonna have to play with this so the, i think that's where the that that that, that, that was all conscious there was a lot of that's where the lit, the literary aspect of slipstream comes in that's why it's more than mixing fantasy with science fiction you have that literary aspect where you play with the with with the prose itself to get the story across but um seshad has a moment of crisis i in the third book i think was that <laughs> first i love that scene but second were you writing about yourself <laughs> In that, I, I was, I was, uh, for the sake of my sanity, and because writing has to be enjoyable for me, you know, first and foremost. Even if the book doesn't sell, if I if I had fun writing it, at least it's something. I knew I'm, I was going to have to have a goddess of writing. Mm. Now she's not a Mary Sue. I made perfectly clear I'm the Chronodendron, <laughs> and, uh, and and there's another goddess that is not Psyche that has a lot more of my personality in it, and I always have to kind of refrain myself from getting into that explore those demons that it's not Seshat but Seshat is where I pour in all my frustrations while writing and it's very cathartic and it really helps building her character she's she's a character then again she started to to be just a chronicler you know she would just be there on the side just making little comments here and there I wanted to I, I wanted to make her you know mysterious and someone that always had all the answers but wouldn't give it away but again she just evolved and became a lot more approachable and 
kind of comical sometimes because when I'm stuck, something <laughs> or things that happen when you write, and I, I just I just feed her all these bits and it works so well. <laughs> Even if she was a uh, art relief, many of the things she says, I found them quite applicable to history, you know, especially when Seshat makes so many remarks regarding how history is remembered based on what is written and that she had to get the story right so she could, or people could learn about it in the future. So even, or to prevent something else similar, something similar from happening in the future. And she keeps making these comments and trying to get all the facts. But even as she tries, she still fails to get all the facts. I thought it was quite interesting. If you look at it from the point of view of a historian, we can't say that something happened in the past. We know that there are clues that indicate that something happened, especially if we go into ancient times. But we are still missing details. We know that we are missing more details. And Meshat has that idea through, or at least conveys that idea. And I think it's in the in the third book. And there is a, she has a lot of desperation, you know, that she's missing bits, that she can't document everything and tries to make up in the on the last book, on the fifth one. Because she that's why she's desperately looking for Nemozini. She needs to find the goddess of memory. So she's sure about what she's writing. That's kind of her arc. And that's going to be the center plot of OBA. Okay, then in that case, I won't ask for them. So more Seshat in Oublier, though? Yes. Excellent. A lot of Seshat in Oublier. <laughs> and she, she really grew on me over the course of the series. I think the first book, I didn't honestly get attached to a lot of characters in the first book, but many of them grew on me throughout. Like Seshat was one of them. Um, and yeah, I found her struggles interesting, but also just her role in the story and her interesting relationship with Hermes. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that she glows and lets him back. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love her, uh, their relationship and I, I, I will expand on, on this. I don't know if anyone, at least no one ever mentioned. Hermes is Anubis in a sense that in the, is the Anubis equivalent in Greek mythology. So I, I play with that a lot and that's why we'll see later on. That's why they, they, they have this unexplained affinity and kind of i call it a bromance because there's actually not nothing very romantic there but it's just kind of a brother and sister kind of situation (laughs) and i wish i had explored it more i I have many 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 words written on the subject and i might revisit it but uh, but it was more because of that that even without them they don't know exactly why but or she doesn't know exactly why why she puts up with this character (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and in, in my head, that is why, because he's the reincarnation of Anubis in, in the real mythology, and she has a connection with Anubis. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely eager for more Seshat. Maybe I'll go read up a little bit on my Egyptian Egyptian mythology. Yeah, I, I think time travel stories, I have found, <laughs> are in general difficult in that, like, if you think about it hard enough, you'll find something that is a paradox or something that doesn't fit together or something unexplained. And I guess it also brings up all other kinds of demons, like questions of free will and determinism and whatnot. So what what were some things that you did while plotting <laughs> to try and make it as waterproof as you can? I have I have the last two hours of the audiobook to go yet. So far, it seems <laughs> pretty tight to me. It, it's more of a plotting question. How how did you go about planning it so you don't have holes from your perspective? Oh, yeah. Like you said, th- there's always holes if you think about it. What I did was I started at the end. If you know exactly where it's going to end, you can you can do the, the full circle thing. Mm-hmm. And, and, that, and that closes a lot of holes if you just keep it contained. Of course, in this case beginning and then it's the whole history of the universe so i don't know i'm probably gonna <laughs> screw up at some point but i managed to keep timelessness contained and another thing is because i'm approaching the story from a metaphorical and a metaphysical point of view and time travel stories like i keep saying this and put it on a t-shirt they are not about uh 
physics. They, they are not about, you know, actual time travel. They are stories of redemption. So when I keep that in mind in every character's arc, it, it kind of, I think it kind of smooths over any, any little plot holes or inconsistencies that might happen because we are perceived time in a linear fashion. That's always my first perspective is from the point of view of the character, are they redeeming themselves? Does that make sense within their actions? If you go full circle, does it make sense? Mm, I found it impressive when I read the final book and especially in the last two hours, everything ties up. I honestly, (laughs) there are some things from the first book and this is, I think that I remember them also because I read them quite back to back. There are some things that you are tying up on the fifth book from the first book and on the second one as well and everything converges and yeah. I thought it was a masterpiece. Oh, thank you. That that really makes us. That was like three months of banging my head against the screen because, like I said, it was supposed to be nine books. That, that was all just one book. So it, it most of the things tied it up, but not all because I was, you know, counting on sequels uh, and in this big story arc. And when I decided to finish there, Nanamnesis, then I was like, oh, shit, how am I going to do this? Because I did not plan for this. I only, only like halfway in the film sex, I realized I'm going to have to just to stop. W- once I realized I, I had to write an acronym and then I still had another book. And I have to stop because otherwise I'm going to be writing Timelessness book 20 in my 50s. And then no one's going to buy it at that point. So it was three months of literally t- trying to tie everything together. And I, I, it, it should have been like six months because if there's one thing that I'm kind of... We, we're never happy with our work. But I think the pros suffer from that because I was so intent of just getting the story properly finished in terms of storyline that I slacked my prose a bit. It might be just me, but it seriously was it was three very intense months where I thought I couldn't do it. And it is sloppy. That's why I have the, those little moments in time. So I had to call them moments in time because if I call them epilogues, no one's <laughs> on the wing. I have like four or five epilogues <laughs> to kind of tie everything together. There were epilogues, but it was like, it happened and that was the only thing that mattered, that it happened. That is how I read it, at least. But uh, yeah, I thought it was genius. Thank you. That makes it all worth it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I also thought it was really interesting. I can't remember other stories that do this. I'm sure there are. But the the fact that you go to the future to change things, usually go to the past and change things around to make things go differently than they would have. But in the story, the few characters go to the future to try and change things which i thought was immensely interesting but also did you have any like reasons for that or did it just happen as you were plotting yes because again i'm working in this circle that time is a flat disk and we're all stuck in it. so if mm-hmm. if you look at time from a higher dimension it's it's flat it's just a flat disk so I'm, I'm really working with that so things do influence each other and i went to the future to change the past because someone had used that point in the future to influence other aspects. Mm-hmm. So everything is connected. And I thought, at least from a, a narrative point of view, we would probably get the reader's attention a little bit more, this idea of going to the future to change the past. But it, it is all it's all connected. So I have another question, and I think this one ties up to one of the key points of the story, that Will is the main enabler of the gods' abilities. And we have this, on the last book, we have this, I think, gorgeous scene in which Psyche is actually faltering and because of what is happening and she's losing her power and suddenly she regains her will and becomes even more powerful than before. Beyond that, even when the gods teleport, they do so because they will it, because they will to be in a different place. And it ties up, I thought it was one of my theories, actually, as a reader, when I was reading it, is that perhaps you chose it because in all of the mythologies, the gods are always so focused on in, uh, imposing their will on everybody else. The magic system, it's exactly as you described. I, I knew that was going to have to be based on willpower, on the god's will, exactly. And I, and I created these gods as these entities that have an influence in the universe, in reality, according, you know, they, they, they can exert 
their real reality to some degree, depending on their talents. You know, not all gods apt at certain things. For example, Seshat and Anubis, they don't tell, they, they don't translocate, teleport is for the Nephilim very well. For example, doesn't interact very well with life. You know, there, there's there's little little sides to kind of build their, their personality. But yes, it was it was definitely that idea to work. You know, imagine a universe where everyone's will would be conflicting because that's the thing. Whenever one god wants one thing, it's going to affect the other one because it's not what the other one wants. And, and that's why they are always you know, in conflict. And then sometimes I wonder if, you know, if, if there's something there, just conflicting wills and, and we're just stuck in the middle of it, like uh, in a little tug of war. But it's a bit more complicated. So there, there's one, like pretty much, the, it's, it's not an Easter egg. It's, it's, it's the, one of the greatest clue. I'm going to spoil it here uh, because it is part of the magic system. I don't know if anyone noticed. It's an insight that Edith has. So Edith, her point of view, she's uh, she she understands the gods pretty well, and now she went into this magic. You know, it's, I slowly introduce magic, real magic, into into the story, and and she she has this insight, something like, could reality be just realms connected by veils of cause and consequence? Everything, every action you do, everything where you impose your will go a certain way, it builds upon the, our reality, and we just have to then navigate those realms, those interlocked realms that are created by this global, this universal will, so to speak, and it's kind of what I'm working with. I, I just wanted to ask a question on that, that how is Hecate, she's actually a goddess, but she uses magic, she doesn't use willpower, so what is yeah. the exact difference between Hec or why Hecate is a goddess and doesn't use willpower? She, she uses willpower, but through magic, or her magic, exp- or her willpower expresses itself through magic, or what appears to others as magic. It, it, so every god whose talent is connected to magic or sorcery or witchcraft, uh, it, it, it's a bit, but it's, they're like the the misfits, the outcasts of the other gods, because, you know, I don't, I don't quite understand your talent, you know, because it's kind of a wild card. And they, they have to work, they can't just impose their will. They have to work with the aspects of reality to, to make their will work, being through herbs or the moon. Moons are very important. That's why there's no moons in Niflheim, you know, the, with matter, actual real things that exist to make their will work. They can they can just wish it. They, they are more powerful in a way if, if things really align, but most of the time they are just, you know, dismissed. And she makes a very interesting comment that, of course, you are going to assign magic to women, like the outcasts. And, yeah, and I found it interesting because she has the three faces of a girl on the maiden and the... Always forget the one in the middle, but like you also tied up that me. What happens with Edith? Edith, she's one of the points that were not. You no, know, she's she, she was supposed to be this wild card. Her story will continue in another book. Not done with her. She's she's not a goddess. She's a dryad. I did not lie about that. But I think you know enough now to understand why she has an affinity with magic. <laughs> yeah, there, there is something there. There's another reason, but there's that as well. The Norse mythology dwarfs, not the, the fantasy. Uh, what I was going to say is that Ekati, she's not fate. Uh, no, her faces, they, they are all the same face. They, they don't change in age. They, 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 they kind of reflect her moods, her mind. So she she literally can't keep a straight face because there's always... She, she can, but when she loses control... You, you like the same way that we are thinking several things or feeling in different things about the same problem. That's when she and it's also a way to tell that she's always aware. Of things she she's in a completely different plane. Reality for her, it's it's not the same as the other gods but she's not at all related to fate so there are a lot of like quotable quotes throughout the book and yeah like st- single liners that i like to highlight throughout as i went uh at least as long as i was reading from the kindle list of the audiobook but the yeah I-, I was curious like did you sort of did they just come as you were writing or did you sort of plan to insert them because a lot of them are, i think are tied to the themes that I think you are exploring. So did you sort of have these interesting things to say that you then inserted for some characters or did they just happen as you went? And similar question about humor, because I, I think I, I enjoyed the humor in the book 
quite a bit. <laughs> Once again, like, did you plan to insert the jokes, or did you sort of come in the writing process? The the road, the, the the jokes pretty much came as a, as I was writing. It it just happens, and it's like, oh, this is great because I I, I do like humor in stories, and we are, we've talked a lot. I think sometimes mm-hmm. not, not 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 everything I say is funny, but sometimes my mind goes places that mm-hmm. they can be funny. The the most quotable it's that that is part of the plot. I always start with dialogue. If I if, if I want to get a point across, I start with an aphorism. I always build on on, on that. So my first drafts are pretty much dialogues. And, mm. and then once they are polished, sometimes nice quotes come out of them. I always start with the, with the idea in mind and how it's going to be discussed. And then I fill in the, the rest of the details. This was an amazing, thorough discussion for one of the most unique, plot-twisting and well-written series that I have read in a while. If you haven't read it, just give it a try. It is definitely worth it. Before we do the outros, I want to thank Lily, a subscriber in my newsletter, who sent one of the questions that I asked today. That said, Varsha, thank you so much for joining me to interview Susanna. Thank you so much for letting me get crushed this party. I really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, Susanna, for being patient with all of my questions. Yeah, and you can find me on my YouTube channel, Reading by the Rainy Mountain, and the About page has links to some SFF discussion podcasts, if you're interested. And Susanna, thank you so much for coming to my podcast and for writing such a unique series. I'm really looking forward to the next release. Thank you so much, Libby, for having me. We, um, it's been a pleasure. I, I would I will happily talk about timelessness all day long. So thank you so much. It's been delightful. You can, for those who are listening, if you are interested in timelessness, it's available everywhere. The first book is called Weird Gods. And uh, I have a new one coming up called Oblié, which was originally written as a sequel to Timelessness, but it's now a standalone. So you don't need to have read timelessness to read OBA, but if you do, there's uh, an epigraph at the beginning of each chapter that would help you understand timelessness. So, so no, and it will be out next month, on the 21st, and it's right now available for pre-order on Amazon. Thank you, everyone. You will find the links to their channels and spaces in the episode description, alongside with all of the Amazon links to that Susanna as well. So if you like this episode, Please subscribe and like the video and leave a comment. I always try to answer. Also, you may be interested in subscribing to my newsletter where I generally offer bite-sized bookish discussions and deep dives. The link will be in the description as well. That said, thanks for listening and happy reading. (music) 